Okay, thank you very much. Let me pull up my first slide. And I want to apologize um, and to thank Alan and Paul for all of their efforts to organize this meeting, which have been extremely helpful. And I was intending to be with you, but due to uh, illness was not able to make my flight. I especially want to thank Dr. Morris Melian and his wife, Irene Mo, who are there representing Environmental Health Trust. I will dispense uh, with my resume, which I think is known to, to many of you, except to say that, frankly, uh, I have spent much of my career working in what might be called the marketplace of ideas of science. And just as democracy rests on the freely given consent of the governed, science rests on the free exchange of information. And as I will comment uh, later, we have not had that free exchange of information when it comes to this issue. We do not have robust research programs in many places. I've documented the absence of independent research on a number of issues, starting with the history of manufactured doubt, which has been well documented by a number of colleagues, including in the secret history of the war on cancer, when information about the pap smear was withheld from people. Uh, because it was thought it might undermine the private practice of medicine. And when information on the dangers of tobacco, we know, was, was well manipulated. Now, there are two reasons for the absence of scientific certainty when it comes to this issue. And one, quite frankly, is the genuine complexity of the matter. But another that we have to acknowledge has been the deliberate manipulation and war games that have been carried out over many years that I and others have documented. Now, we are here hosted by the Department of Public Policy, which is entirely appropriate because when it comes to formulating ideas about policy, we don't have the luxury of saying, come back in five years and we'll tell you what we think. We have to base our decisions about what are appropriate policies on several different types of evidence. The first being exposure and modeling studies. Who is exposed and what are they exposed to? And what we know is that we can use anatomically based models in order to set standards for practicing surgery. And we can make some real world measurements and observations. We are less certain about what those exposures may mean. And that's where the work of uh, scientists come in. And I want to stress, as the title of my talk is, What the Animals Try to Tell Us, that if we're really smart, we will interpret animal experiments in order to prevent human harm. But we have become, I think, twisted in our reliance on science when it comes to many issues of public health. And instead of using animal evidence to predict and prevent harm. We are increasingly asked to prove that human harm has already taken place. But I want to stress that every agent that we know for sure causes cancer in humans also produces it in animals when adequately studied. It's important to realize that. The question is, what do we do? Do we predict and prevent the future or do we rely on the much more limited data that we have from human studies? We have epidemiologic evidence, controlled studies, case control studies are the gold standard, so to speak. But keep in mind that epidemiology can only confirm the past. Epidemiology only confirms the past. It should not ever be used to set future policies because what we are enjoined to do as experts in public health and those policymakers who must make these tough decisions is to prevent harm rather than prove that harm has already happened. So when it comes to understanding what electromagnetic fields, I think it's instructive to look at this illustration of the range of the spectrum that goes all the way from the electricity that powers the lights in your room at 50 cycles a second in Israel, 50 hertz, 60 hertz in the United States. You cannot? Just a moment. None of them? Let me go back. I'm sorry. Let me go back. 
And I'm so sorry. Let me figure out, it'll take a moment. Let me get this off of here. Great, um, I'm trying to do share meeting, share screen. And you called, but you called me, right? So I'm not, Paul, you have my slides there, don't you? I think, yes, I think I'm gonna ask you to go to, go to my um, fifth slide and I'll have you run my slides because I think, I, I don't know why they're not sharing at this time. While you're bringing that up, let me just say that I was referring here to the spectrum. And the point I was making is that there is a broad spectrum of what is non-ionizing radiation. Uh, and it extends from the electricity that turns on the lights all the way up to and through ionizing radiation, uh, X-rays, gamma and cosmic radiation. Um, do you have that slide up? It's number five. And I'm in the meantime going to try to figure out why I can't bring you up uh, on my Zoom. Here's um, I will continue in the meantime. Um, the, the point I want to make about the electromagnetic fields is that they are genuinely complex. And we can talk about them in terms of energy. We can talk about them in terms of the wavelength or distance they have to go. And what we know, um, and please signal to me when you do have the slides. Shall I send you another share from um, my Dropbox? Well, that's gonna, no, it's gonna be, it will be Adobe, it won't work, just a moment. You know, if you, you know what, Paul, I think that I should call you back, it worked the other way around, and let me just do that. I'm gonna call you back, let's hang up right now. And I'm sorry for the video purposes, I'll try to do it more quickly and we'll go through it. Let's hang up this wall right now. Hello? All right, is it working now? We hear you. Yes, but can you see me? Just a moment. I can see you. <laughs> oh, Martin can see me, but that's... that's uh, <laughs> hold on. All right, it should be... It says it's seeing now. Yes? Yes? We don't see your video feed yet, we see you. Just a moment. Oh, gosh. We, it was working before. Uh, all right, now? Uh, 
I am, now I will share the screen, just a moment. All right, and I have, right, just a second. Okay, um, now the screen should be shared. Goodness, we had it before. Um, I'm, I don't know what else to do, guys. Let me just go back. Um, I, I did, I did. So um, I try it again and, it, and it's clicking off this time. You see my video. I have shared screen, but now I have to hold on. I need to move this out of the way. And I don't, I'm afraid if I close it, it will. Do you still, do you still see me? All right, now I should be able to share. Okay. Okay, uh, now um, I began talking about the title of my talk, which is an update, and the title listed in the program was What the Animals Try to Tell Us. So let me go through this very quickly since I've already said this to you. And my work has documented the fact that the science is not only complicated, it has been manipulated. And I think that Martin Paul is going to address some of that uh, when he speaks. When it comes to the type of types of evidence that we have, I indicated we had three major types because public policy has to act based on uncertain and incomplete information. So we have exposure and modeling studies, then we have animal studies, and the animal studies are intended to predict and prevent harm in, in humans, and keep in mind that every agent that we know that causes cancer in humans will produce it in animals when adequately studied. And finally, we have epidemiology, and I am both a toxicologist and epidemiologist, so I have to tell you, we should never rely or insist on epidemiologic evidence before taking steps to develop precautionary policies. Otherwise, we're treating people like they're in an experiment, often with no controls. So epidemiology confirms the past. Now, the spectrum of electromagnetic fields extends all the way from the 50 hertz, which is powering your light, to the 36 quadrillion and more uh, that is in the cosmic and X-ray spectrum. What we are particularly concerned about here is the cell phone Wi-Fi spectrum, and here 5G falls somewhere around here. And we have scientific information that 5G increases permeability, can accelerate cell growth. So the question is, what evidence do we need to take precautionary steps? Now, when we talk about 5G, I wanna make sure that you understand that there's not one size fits all. In fact, the specs for 5G are still being written as I speak. In the United States today, in some football stadiums, you can get 5G so that you have the opportunity to simultaneously take a video beam it to a friend, watch the game, eat your popcorn, all at the same time. But it's working at 700 megahertz as the carrier. And it means that 5G antennas have to have within them 3G and 4G because most of the devices in this stadium are in fact 3G and 4G. Very few people have 5G ready devices. The high frequency cells are being used right now for some environmental monitoring and frankly for surveillance activities in a number of cities. And finally, the millimeter wave of 26 gigahertz and above will be used for some other connections. The question we have to ask ourselves among many is, is this a public health risk? And the answer in my opinion and that of Dr. Paul and others is yes. 
it is. And we have evidence that it could be, that it is a risk. And we'll talk about some of that. But before doing that, I'd like to share with you this schemata that shows you the different aspects that we can look at when we're thinking about what a signal is. A signal is many complex things. It has frequency, it has power, it has beats or pulse per second, it has power density, it has polarity, information content. All of those different things characterize what a signal is. And it's very um, easy to confuse people by not clarifying what aspect of what you're uh, referring to when you present it. More importantly, we know from new research just published, supported by the American Cancer Society and carried out at Yale, that genetic factors such as single nucleotide SNPs make a difference in whether or not people are more or less susceptible to certain environmental exposures, in particular cell phone radiation. So all of these factors influence the biological response that you get. And yet we very seldom will hear about a clarification of what exactly was, was the signal continuous? Was it disruptive? Was it uh, altered? Uh, what was the power density? Uh, what, um, what aspects of exposure uh, were controlled. If you look here, what I'm showing you is that in terms of power density, which is measured in volts per meter on the y-axis, you see that through a four-second phone call, you get these huge swings in power density over time. And it's thought that the constant change in peak exposure is what makes the biological impact. So it's not the power but the pulse. And as Dr. Cindy Russell has said, pulse is poison. And it's the repeated exposure to these pulses that is important. So now let's take a step back and ask, what has not changed since the 20th century? Well, interestingly, radar ranges were first introduced uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Women didn't like the idea of cooking with radar. So they changed the name to microwave. That is the origin of the term microwave, by the way. The original cell phones were uh, weighed about two and a half pounds, cost at that time $3,900, which would be about $9,000 today. You see Maxwell Smart there with his shoe phone. But, and they were sold at the time when gas sold for about $1.30 a gallon. Those things have changed in some way, but what has not changed is the standards that we use to test phones today are the same standards that have been used since 1996. The radar range didn't go too well. It became the microwave oven. I want to share with you this statement from the FDA website. There is no pre-market safety testing for phones. There could be, that is their authorizing statute could allow it, but the FDA website says they do not review the safety of cell phones. And the FDA website further says, and I quote, they, can, they have the authority to take action if cell phones are shown to emit radio frequency energy at a level that is hazardous to the user. In that case, they could require them user manufacturers to repair, replace, or recall the phone. They could do this, but they are not doing this. And I submit uh, that they are missing in action and have been, unfortunately, for some time. So another thing that hasn't changed is that the methods for testing phones are based on this guy. We call him Sam. It's short for Standard Anthropomorphic Mannequin. He's got a big empty head and we pour homogenous fluid into it he doesn't talk a lot because we only measure what happens during a six minute phone call. One thing that will never change is that the base of all of our cells is DNA, in the, in the nucleus of every cell. We have uh, DNA, this exquisite double helix of nucleotide bonds. And that is what holds us all together. Now, identical twins don't have precisely the same DNA. 
although they come from one egg that splits in two. They are uh, shown here with these methylation patterns that are uh, fluoresce green from chromosomes that have been identified in identical trends from studies that have been done in Scandinavia. But look at the same twins at age 50. They do not look like they're even related to one another. So as identical twins age, their chromosomes begin to look less similar. And what this is telling us is that the environment is critically important. Genes may give us the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. As an example of that, here are some more recent studies that have been done in Denmark, also with identical twins, where they looked, if you see here the pattern on the top, this, these are the young identical twins, and this is showing a great deal of correlation between their chromosomal activation. But by the time the same twins are older, you see the spread here. And whether you know any science or, at all, this is clearly showing again, that over time, even identical twins stop looking like they're related to one another. Environmental factors ranging from stress to exposure to chemicals to a whole host of things make a huge difference in the health of identical twins. With respect to that DNA, Henry Lai and Vijay Singh developed a brilliant and innovative assay and in, the, in a real wor fair world, they would receive the Nobel Prize in Medicine for what this work was. They showed that you could take the DNA and unravel it and it would form a tail seen here as it starts to unravel or here. This DNA unraveling occurred with the equivalent of 1600 chest x-rays. This DNA unraveling occurred with one day of mobile phone exposure at a permissible level at the time. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all doomed because we have lots of repair, that's one of the benefits. But it is important to recognize that while there are important differences between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, seen here, ionizing radiation is, is faster with more energy, it can break chemical bonds directly, but non-ionizing radiation with its lower frequency and lower energy and thermal effects also can in fact damage DNA. And I'm going to show you why and how we know that from studies completed most recently at the US National Toxicology Program that have been carried out there, but many other studies that have been carried out around the world also show this damage to DNA, this increase of reactive oxygen species and the damage to male and female health. Here is one of the studies from earlier in this century, the EU Reflex Project originally led by Franz Edelkofer. It was a four-year project in 12 uh, groups in seven European countries, well over $10 million of funding. And they were able to show a change in the structure of the DNA and the function of the genes that were damaged. So you got from intermittent exposures, you got breaks in a single and double strand DNA breaks, and you got them in human fibroblasts. Most interestingly, you got them in stem cells, but not in mature cells. So that indicates as an example, the further complexity of what we're talking about here. One needs to talk, specify the type of cell, the age, if you will, and uh, uh, many other components. This study done in two, 20, 2006 was immediately subject to war games. So a lot of scientific uncertainty was manufactured about it. Igor Belyaev, about a, a year earlier, had reached the same conclusion, looking at a number of different studies that he had done at specific DNA repair genes, 53 beta and uh, uh, H2AX foci in human cells. Looking at human cells, he showed DNA damage. And with the GSM, which was then the most common exposure, he also showed that some frequencies damage all cell types, while other frequencies only damage a few. And again, we should never let the complexity of the science, which is real, prevent us from formulating reasonable public policy. Now, what we can say, 
again from earlier studies, is that exposure to radio frequency below the current safety limits has caused damage synergistically. And if you look at the graph on the right, you see that the black is the control cells that were exposed to a known chemical carcinogen. We know it causes uh, cancer in animals, ethyl nitrosyurea. And then when you added that known carcinogen to exposure to cell phone radiation, you got an accelerated effect, a doubled effect or more with a low amount of radio frequency radiation, which is consistent with the Ramazzini findings that Dr. Melnick is going to be talking to you about later. Now the NTP study was requested in 1999. Dr. Melnick is going to go over it in detail, but again, I want to just stress the summary of it was that they found statistically significant increases in cancer and borderline significant increases in cancer and hyperplasia and dysplasia in multiple organs. And they also showed DNA damage in both rats and mice, the male rat and the female and male mouse. And nonetheless, for reasons that many of us do not understand, the FDA has rejected the findings of the NTP as not relevant to humans. Well, <clears throat> they point out, for example, that the animals weren't making phone calls. No, that's actually not quite what they say. They say that the whole body exposure was not relevant to phone exposure. Well, I, I, frankly, we object. That is in fact what people are getting all the time with phones in your pocket, phones close to your body, and it's proximity to the body that is the issue. We know there's tumor promoting effects, um, and this is from a number of different studies have shown this. And it may be that there are metabolic changes, changes in permeability that could explain it. But in the interest of time, I'm going to try, I'm going to skip over this slide of the DNA damage that was published by the NTP, because I know that Dr. Melnick will discuss it in, in more detail. But you can see a clear dose response in the very top one here. And this is a CDMA exposure for the mouse frontal cortex. That's the part of the brain. This is suggesting that in fact, the brain in the mouse and perhaps in us is uniquely sensitive to this radiation. Now, when it comes to sperm, humans need a lot of sperm to make a healthy baby. They are produced at the rate of 90,000 uh, a minute. And in order to succeed, they have to swim the equivalent of from Los Angeles to Hawaii, uh, and it is truly survival of the fittest. Some people have asked, and as I've said in my TEDx talk that I suggest you may like to look at, the reason you need so many sperm is that they do not know how to ask for directions. But what we do know from really brilliant work that's been carried out by uh, uh, Kasari in uh, 2018, recently published, is that we have multiple exposures the body does not differentiate. We know the highest exposure is from the cell phone. There's no debate about that. But we know that depending on proximity to a tower, depending on your use of ovens, depending on whether you actually keep a laptop on the lap, which no one should do anymore, and, and where and how many routers you may be exposed to, all of that influences the development of LSH and FSH, the development of pituitary hormones which in, flow, in, in turn influence lytic cells and have an effect on the quantity and quality of the sperm that's produced, including that reactive <laughs> oxygen species can be stimulated by this exposure and that those can directly damage sperm cells. Now, the effects have been shown to influence a whole cascade of proteins seen here with ligand protein receptors. And these proteins can either tell cells to die, apoptosis, or they can influence the development of cancer. So again, it's the structure or the function of DNA that can be affected by cell phone radiation. So that even though DNA does, uh, cell phone radiation does not have strength enough to break the basic nucleotide bonds, it can damage DNA. 
and it can do it through a variety of mechanisms that have been suggested here in this work uh, by, by Kessari, including gene activation of free, by free radicals that are formed, as well as interfering with calcium uh, channels, as you will hear from Dr. Paul. Now, when it comes to experiments that have been done with, with mammalian sperm, it's important to realize we actually have a, we have a lot of data here. It's not often just spoken about, but we do. And one study that I participated in with colleagues involved looking at the effect of cell phone radiation directly on testis. And the slides are from an animal, but I wanna direct your attention to this visualization here. You will see that the highest exposure goes into the testis. That is the hot source of highest exposure when a phone is in the pocket. And this is based on anatomically based modeling developed by Claudio Fernandez and Alvaro de Salas at Porto Alegre in, in Brazil. The control slide here shows you nice borders and cell walls, and the exposed show an absence of that integrity. Again, suggesting that one of the consequences of this exposure is to damage membranes, damage integrity. Again, uh, this is a a uh, more recent publication showing effects on mitochondria. And again, the black bars are the exposed germline, germ cells, and the white is the control. So over time, the white will increase because there's going to be damage from time. Sperm are not meant to survive outside of the body for long. But what you see here is a st very statistically significant difference with certain of these genetic alterations in sperm that are exposed to cell phone radiation. Damage to the mitochondrial superoxides. Mitochondria is the engine of the cell. A very significant effect. All of these slides and all of the references to them are embedded in the slides. So I we can share those with you. This is again an increase in reactive oxygen species uh, shown in the germ cells here with again, over time, you see a greater effect. But if you look at, at the uh, bars here, you'll see that the exposure to um, radio frequency radiation here dramatically increases the effect. And the weight of the testis is also affected in this new study from, from Houston. And again, you see the control cells here at the top and you look at the exposed at, at, at the very bottom and you see again, the loss of integrity. And over time, the mouse testis, the exposed testis is significantly, has significantly less weight. And that's, that's important because of course, you want to have the healthiest organ that you can in order to ensure reproductive health. Other studies have looked at vitality and motility. And again, not surprisingly, over time, this is the sham. That is to say, they just were allowed to sit there for time. Not much happens. But when you get exposure here in the red, you see a substantial decrement in vitality, motility, and motility meaning the ability to swim. So if a sperm can't swim, it's not gonna succeed in fertilizing anything. And these are serious problems and they're so serious that all fertility clinics now around the world recommend that men having problems impregnating their partners get their phones and other devices off their bodies. That's standard advice. And this uh, diagram I think is relevant to what Dr. Paul is going to be showing you as well, which is that calcium channels, which are key to membranes, absolutely key, can be affected by exposure to cell phone radiation. And once that happens, you get a cascade of reactions that can inhibit repair, and repair proteins like tyrosine phosphatase. It can in inhibit the ability of kinases, which normally would have the job of fixing or cells or telling them to die when they, they can't be saved. And all of these things can be affected by cell phone radiation. In this new paper by uh, Sir John Aitken uh, from Australia, who has published one of the most impressive bodies of work in this field. 
and has identified a number of explanations for the worldwide decline in male reproductive health. Now, I am not telling you that the decline in male reproductive health is due to cell phones alone. Pesticides, tight underwear and clothing, warm baths, radiation, all of these things are known to who affects the quality of a man's reproductive health. But cell phone radiation is certainly one of the factors that has to be looked at as well. Because when it comes to male reproduction, we know that reactive oxygen species play a role, both a positive role and a negative role, like many things in, in, in life. And you can get an increase in oxidative stress, which in turn damages lipids, which of course can damage membranes, which are largely lipid, and can damage DNA. And you get effects on capacitation and fertilization from both in, in endogenous sources, those are inherent within the body, and exogenous ones. And I would add to the list here of radiation and smoking and alcohol, uh, cell phone radiation as well. The brain is an amazing thing. And at birth, it contains about 100 billion neurons that be get, get to be pruned, but the size at birth is about a third that of an adult. And it grows so fast that by age two, it is more than doubled, it's more than doubled. So the growth of the brain during pregnancy is hard to imagine because it starts with just a clump of cells at the top of the neural stem and then turns into this incredible complex whole of a brain with all of the pathways in it. But what we know from studies that have been done repeatedly by my colleagues at Andakuz Mayuz University in Turkey is that prenatal exposure to cell phone radiation in animals clearly causes a downsizing and deterioration of brain cells. Uh, the slide on the left are healthy with lots of nice boundaries and cell walls. And the slide on the right exposed to, EFF, to EMF have lost their integrity um, largely. And so we see an, an increase in this damage uh, to these cells. I believe these were from the dentate gyrus. Um, and that's part of the hippocampus, which is critical to balance impulse control, thinking, and essential things of this sort. Now, when it comes to understanding exposure, we have done work again with our colleagues in Brazil, and we have shown that the child's brain can absorb much more radiation. The head may absorb the same amount, but the brain of the child contains more fluid. It can absorb more exposure, seen here with the yellow, white, getting the highest exposure if a phone is held right next to the relatively thin skull. And if you look at the girl's uh, face right here, watch what happens in terms of her exposures as you see this going through as well. And this is anatomically based work. All right. So, Well, now, in 2011, the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, Dr. Nora Volkov, published this really important study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And she was able to show, this is with a PET scan, which she helped to invent, by the way, that this is a normal brain with the cell phone turned off. And she had us two phones on, on volunteers who did not know if the phone was turned on or not. So they had no sound at all. But with 50 minutes of phone radiation, there's more glucose in the part of the brain with the highest exposure. That's a pretty profound and important finding. Unfortunately, her work on the epidemic of opioid poisonings and deaths in the United States and other factors have prevented her or anyone else from following up on this important observation. And what we do know is that many forms of dementia have been called diabetes of the brain. 
And this is a stark indication that you're altering glucose metabolism. Now, it's not all doom and gloom because other studies done uh, by Turkish colleagues and others had shown that if you expose cells to EMF, you get damage. But if you expose them to melatonin or to omega-3 fatty acids, you can reverse and prevent that damage. So we need to pay attention to the ability of certain agents to help repair damage and understand that it's not uh, all that we're at risk all the time. And in fact, those people who sleep in the dark when you make melatonin and eat your broccoli and eat your uh, uncontaminated fish are going to be protecting their brains from lots of things, including damage from EMF. But the evidence of damage is not limited just to experimental studies. We now have studies in teenagers. This was produced as a follow-up study uh, in 2015 from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And they showed decreased memory performance in adolescents with increased cell phone use, looking at phone records. Now we in the United States have never done a study with phone records. The last time anyone tried to do a study on cell phones in the United States on brain cancer, believe it or not, was 2001. And we have very poor information available to those who want to study this. But looking at what I showed you experimentally, what happened prenatally, I think it would be foolish for us to dismiss these findings. And again, to insist that we need more proof of human harm. Here is some proof of human harm. It comes from the Interphone study, Appendix 2. This is the number of cases, the number of controls, and this is the odds ratio. That is the relative risk for people who have uh, brain cancer and have not used phones very much, and those who have used phones for longer periods of time, indicated here. 10 plus years of cell phone use, a doubled risk of glioma. And when, that's, and when that 10 plus years was analyzed further for the highest and heaviest users, there was a tripled or greater risk of glioma. Again, five to nine years, um, uh, 1.5, that's a 50% increase in risk. Um, the difference between these two numbers is not statistically significant. The point is there is evidence of a risk in humans for brain cancer. There's also more recent studies, which, which is why Anthony B. Miller, a very distinguished researcher who has published more than 600 articles and is a collaborator of mine, he has concluded in an article we published in the past two years, that given all of the evidence I presented to you here today and more that you will be hearing about in the course of this meeting, cell phone radiation causes brain cancer. We can say that it is a definite human carcinogen. The one study, the types of studies that do not find an increased risk are cohort studies, meaning they follow a group of people through in time. The Benson study, which was supposed to be a million women, was not a million women. The rate of brain cancer that you expect in the general population is seven per 100,000. So studying a million women does not give you enough power to find an effect. And they only asked the question about cell phone use once and then waited to see what would happen. That is not a very robust design and it has been criticized repeatedly by Tony Miller and others for its lack of methodological clarity. In contrast, Leonard Hardell of Sweden has produced a number of studies that find only with 10 years or more of cell phone use, a significantly increased risk. And for those few people that have used a phone for 25 years or more, a tripled risk of brain cancer. So more recently, Corot conducted a national study in France six years ago now, and again showed with more than 10 years of exposure, a 60% increase in risk. And if one looked at those with urban residents and exposure, there was a fourfold increased risk. Now we don't know what it was about the urban environment that increased that risk, 
But remember what I said, we study animals to predict harm in humans. We should not have to prove it in order to take steps to reduce exposures. Here is new work from Alistair Phillips in the UK published and Phillips has shown this change in glioma, the same tumor we're concerned about, and the change in glioma is occurring, I just spoke to him earlier, and you'll be delighted to hear from him later, the change is occurring in all age groups. So if the increase in glioma were due to an improvement in diagnostic ascertainment, CAT scans made available to the elderly, for example, you wouldn't expect to see any increase in glioma in young people. You'd expect to see it only in the elderly, but you're seeing it in all age groups. So the total brain, the total brain cancer rates have not changed in other regions, but for glioma of the temporal and frontal lobes, look at that increase and much of it only since 2000. A more recent study is done, has been done at Yale, as I mentioned, looking at nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, and they have found that people with the four of the most commonly found genetic um, alterations were more than twice as likely to develop thyroid cancer, again, suggesting that there is a different susceptibility. This is brilliant and important work, and it's been being developed over many years by this team of researchers uh, who think that this is an important factor. We are seeing increases in thyroid cancer all over the world, and we don't have a good explanation for it. Some of it might be due to increased ascertainment because thyroid nodules are very common, but cancer is showing up in younger and younger people. We are seeing rectal cancer as well as thyroid cancer in people under the age of 30, under the age of 40. And unfortunately, because rectal cancer is seldom suspected in that young an age group, they're often diagnosed at more advanced stages. Now the data on humans is not, of course, going to be just cancer. There have been a few studies that have looked at markers in the blood of people who live close to towers. And this is one study that compared blood markers of those who lived 80 meters close to a tower, those who lived 300 meters away were the controls. This is done in India. They looked in the blood at antioxidant status at looked, and looked at glutathione and these different proteins that are involved in DNA repair that I've mentioned before and showed a significant reduction in the repair enzymes and proteins and an increase in lipid peroxidation. Of course, that would mean an increase in cell membrane damage and in calcium gated channel operation. So you're going to get a number of effects. All of this has been shown statistically significantly worse in people who live closer to these mobile phone base stations. Well, what about the trees? What about the rest of us? The trees have shown damage. This is a study published in the Science of the Total Environment. If you look carefully at this tree, this, these are the base stations here. The tree looks like it's almost trying to go away from the towers. And in fact, they've done an analysis, a statistical analysis of these tree patterns. This is the Norway maple tree that they found. This is in 2015. And um, they are continuing to do this work. I think this is work that could be done in Israel as well. And here is a more extreme example. Here, the tree is to moving away from this. And obviously, this is the same tree, by the way. It's not, this is the same tree. This is a healthy part. This is not. I don't, I don't know the exact distances here. Finally, there's been work on insects. And there was work done by the um, respected researchers at the ITIS um, in Austria. And in Switzerland, I'm sorry. And this is a paper that actually made a model of the honeybee. And they showed two gig and 24 gig. This 24 gig is what you're going to be getting with 5G. And clearly it resonates with the body and it increased the power density, which means the absorption 
into that body three up to threefold. More, more recently, look at this brief video. New research from scientists at Punjab University in India. Can you hear microwave it? Microwave radiation from mobile phones could be part of the problem. Researchers fitted mobile phones to a hive. Sorry. Powered them up for two 15 minute periods each day. After three months, they found the bees stopped producing honey, egg production by the queen bee hive, and the size of the hive dramatically reduced. New research from scientists at Punjab University in India. I'm trying to, okay, so that study has been followed up by other studies at beehives in Belgium. This was just reported very recently. And they looked at hives in rural areas and urban areas. And what they were able to show with a model that they made of the, of the, uh, of the bees is the greater absorption, of course, is going to be in the queen bee, which is the largest body. But these workers and the drones and the larvae all absorb more power as the frequency goes up. And this is frequency is measured right here. And this is the absorbed power. I think, again, it's, that's an experiment we don't really want to carry out because without bees, we have no agriculture. These are the models that they made. And those of you who are interested should look at the paper because it's really very elegant work to produce these models, uh, it takes quite a bit. And the researchers who do this work are of course concerned. And that's why they've done it because they believe that we could be uh, unleashing an experiment with devastating impact on the environment. I will share one example of what we know. This is a special about edition phones. of Marketplace. Most of us carry our phones next to our body. And why wouldn't we? Science, tests, and the hidden message in your cell phone. So the tests are all done. Tests are all finished. And? The number exceeded the limit. It went up significantly uh, with each one of the phones. That's right. The phones exceeded the safety limit when they were moved right against the body. The radiation absorbed increased three to four times. Radiation increased three to four times when the phone was tested directly next to the body. Now you would think that since the FDA can act when there's evidence of a hazard, it would have acted, but no, it did not. You will hear later today from Theodora Scarato, who will share with you the results from the Chicago Tribune tests, where they, where they publicize the results of their tests. Although we at Environmental Health Trust have been concerned about this issue and warned that no phone will pass a test if it's really tested next to the body. Here is the most recent data uh, from France that uh, we have graphed. And I want to show you, if you look here on the bars on the bottom, 900 megahertz and 1800 megahertz tested at five millimeters and 10 millimeters away, they're fine. There's no problem. However, when you test them directly on the body, Look at the difference in the amount of radiation. Those results have led the French government to do something that I hope the Israelis will do, which is to test phones the way they're used. When you test phones the way they're used, most of them fail to meet the standard. When you test them the way the manufacturers advise, which can be up to 25 millimeters, almost an inch off the body, you get these stunning results. And because of that, the French now are taking steps that you'll hear about from Theodora Scarato to take action. These are the results just released this week on the iPhone 11. It exceeds the FCC's limit by double, double, okay? Now, what's going to happen with that depends entirely. We in the United States do not have a fully functioning government, as I think you know, but then the, you can't, we can compete with you in that regard, I suppose. But you do have ministries with excellent people working in them who can take this information and do something with it. And you do have the capacity to get more information. If you'd like to join with us, we're, we're going to hear from Theodora later. Uh, you'll hear from Marco Razi about the French in more detail. Please sign up 
at ehtrust.org slash Tel Aviv and get involved in what we're doing in terms, we have many podcasts and Patreon seminars, but I wanna conclude with this. This is an image uh, that I took um, when I visited um, Auschwitz. And there's a motto on it that I think is relevant to what we're doing today. Remember I said, animals predict the future, but people in epidemiology confirm the past often with death, unfortunately. And this statue says, we honor the dead by warning the living. We warn the living. And I think we have enough information now to warn the living. And we also see a robust research program to clarify what is going on rather than assume everything is fine until we find out that it's not. Thank you very much. A question or two from the audience, is there a question? Everything's clear. Uh, I, I, no. Deborah, first of all, thank you for staying up late wherever you must be now and joining us. And, you know, I, said, I was remarking to a friend the last time I got up, I actually got up at 1.30, uh, was when I was climbing a volcano, uh, and that was a different experience. But this feels quite similar in that we've got a mountain to climb here, that's for sure. And I appreciate your creating the opportunity for us to do that, because there are so many important issues here, and policy can't wait for the science to get more robust than it is now. Right. I just wanted to go back to those very disturbing numbers that you showed us with regard to even a tripling of, of certain kinds of brain cancer. And, and um, I was wondering if you could give us a sense of general prevalence. In other words, yes, uh, obviously there seems to be uh, increased risk. Is this a de minimis risk in terms of a general individual when we think about overall risk? Do you have some sense you give us a context? Because that's very important when we try to present these findings. Sure. And, and I think the, the, the clear answer is I don't know. But here's what I think. Because we are exposing children, and right now in the United States we are exposing toddlers and infants in increasing levels, People are giving them phones as toys and pacifiers when they're in a supermarket or whatever. And children are entranced with these things because they love the fast moving images. The young brain is just, every, every child that does Skype with their grandparents is always posing and they know how to do that at a very young age now. Because exposures are starting at such a young age and because there's the undeniable sociological psychological and I think physiological addiction that we all know of. The fact that there also are physical effects, and there are, I think should give us great reason to reduce exposure to children, as indeed the French and many others are doing. And Israel started out saying it was going to do that, and then I think they may have backtracked a bit because the technology again is so exciting but the virtual reality goes right into the frontal lobe. If you look at our website, we have actually, we published papers on that with neuro neuroanatomically correct modeling. So the answer is, um, I can't give you numbers, but I should be able to, because you could do a quantitative risk assessment. I would say it like this, when it comes to cancer alone, only cancer of the brain, you have a, a, a risk of a horrible disease that's relatively low, all right? So if the rate of brain cancer was to go from seven per 100,000 to 28 per 100,000, it would quadruple, but it might not be that big a deal, except if you were the one who got that brain cancer, it would be a really big deal. And it's not limited to brain cancer. We have to now look at thyroid cancer. We have to start to look even at leukemia because it does have a general systemic effect. And we have to look at rectal cancer in children. I mean, we're seeing rectal cancer in uh, 
three, I know of three cases in the past three months of young women, young, thin women in their 30s who were quite sick because, of course, nobody suspected it. And by the time they picked it up, it was metastatic. So I'm afraid I can't give you a straight answer. I would like to be able to, and I would think it would be very worthwhile for people to take what we have of these data and put some numbers to it because it would help to inform the public policymakers. But just in terms of economics, it costs about a million dollars to treat a single case of brain cancer. And unfortunately, of the prognosis is not good. And there have been a couple breakthroughs with vaccines, but still it's a lousy disease. And I'm afraid I can't give you more of an answer than that at this time. I am very concerned about the broad range of effects, not just cancer, again, effects on learning and on memory and on impulse control, perhaps on balance. The Koreans are now issuing uh, public education campaigns because of their concern. I think Israel could do better in this regard as well. You have the makings of the information. You have the information is accessible. I'm looking forward. I'm going to stay up to hear Stellian uh, talk because I'd like to hear what's going on now in Israel because I know that there's a lot of excellent knowledge there that he and others have. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it's been applied. Okay, um, I think we are already a little bit over time. So I think we'll thank Deborah once again for a stimulating, if rather disturbing talk. Thank you very much. Um,